welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, author Gerald Posner on the JFK assassination and conspiracy culture. Kennedy's assassination had passed into being a, sort of a quasi board game. You could sit around a table and say, who killed Kennedy? And people have their own theories. Oh, I think it was the CIA. I think it was the FBI. No, I like Castro. The odd person might say it was Oswald because it had become popular culture in the worst possible way. For Oswald to be part of a plot, he has to be brought in by the conspirators at some point to kill Kennedy. There has to be some evidence of a contact, a person who visits him, somebody who shows up a telephone call. And those seven weeks, there's no evidence of that contact. I conclude that there's no question that Lee Harvey Oswald was the shooter and the only shooter at Dealey Plaza. He fired three shots from behind. He killed the president that day. Gerald, welcome to Chatter. David, great to join you. We've been talking about this for some time. We we have. It seems like we keep circling around it, but we have a auspicious anniversary here. We will be releasing this conversation on the anniversary of John Kennedy's assassination. And it happens to be one of those round numbers, right? So mm-hmm. 1963 to, to 2023. My math isn't good, but that tells me that at least... It's a multiple of 10. Yeah, no, but it's it, it interesting you say a round number. I thought, shows you how I can be wrong, even on the Kennedy assassination sometimes, that the 50th was the big look back. Right. You know, 50 years, everybody says, sort of, you know, we had it on World War II, we've had it on other times. And so that was sort of the moment at which documentaries were done, TV and uh, newspapers were interested. I didn't think there'd be as much, although I knew the documents were still going to be released from the National Archives and there would be news from that. The 60th has received more attention for any number of reasons, but maybe it's the last one in which people who were still there that day playing Mm -hmm. a role, whether it was Secret Service or whatever else, Mm -hmm. Dallas police, others are still alive. Mm -hmm. Late 80s, 90, this is sort of that passing moment there. 70th anniversary, you won't have anybody who was there and has that recollection still still around. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, but that might explain why, you know, in recent years we had, and maybe I'm only interested in this being a history geek, but we had the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. And I remember thinking, 100 years, that, that really is a time to reflect because you you have time to actually process the history. You have time to get just about any source available by then. You have time to see the effects and the secondary and tertiary effects of the event. And there wasn't that much attention to it. And I'm wondering if it's because there was no one living, right? <laughs> you yeah, you no. didn't have the personal stories that, if nothing else, mass media likes to pick up on as the hook for a story. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, you know, even on uh, the round year anniversaries or on the 75th at, at mm. the liberation of Auschwitz, those survivors who had been children at the time and survived the camps now in their 80s, uh, late 80s, added a power and impact to mm. that anniversary that won't be there one day when everybody right. at the commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz is, you know, a second generation uh, person mm-hmm. and nobody's there who has the real account. I, I do think those eyewitnesses add something. And then in addition, we had on the Kennedy instance this year, uh, an actual witness, a guy in his late eighties, mm-hmm. you know, we can talk about this later, a secret service agent who has a new account in a book that says, uh, you know, something that's newsworthy. Um, and so I think that adds to the idea, oh yeah, of course, there are people who are alive. Let's hear what they say. Yeah. And I, I do want to get to that account because it is getting a lot of attention, which is, is fascinating for a number of reasons. And I think it does point to our human tendency to react to, to stories when somebody says I was there. And even if it's 60 years later, now I remember something that I hadn't mentioned before we tend to put a lot of attention on that, even if there's literally roomfuls of evidence that should rationally tell us more. Uh, there's something about the personal account that still absolutely matters to us. Yeah, people love eyewitness accounts. I know this as an attorney, which I was. It seems like in another life, but you know, you get an eyewitness, you get somebody in a stand in a courtroom that 
points to an accused defendant and says, that's the person that assaulted me. I know that without any doubt. It's a powerful testimony, even though, Mm -hmm. you know, lawyers and people study memory and those of us who, you know, look at history and do investigations as journalists understand that, you know, memory is fungible, Mm -hmm. uh, especially memory of things like the Kennedy assassination. You know, there's the the studies of what they call flashbulb memories, memory experts, and flashbulb memories are traumatic, terrible events like 9-11 the Challenger discovery, uh, October 7th, uh, mm. 7-7 in England when the trains were attacked, these moments at which you hear about a terrible event, yeah. uh, the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King, and you have a memory that's sort of like a flashbulb that used to take place on an old camera. It, it's burnt into your brain for a moment, and, and you have a very vivid recollection of it, more so than something else that happens. But mm. over time, you read accounts, you talk to others who were involved, you see documentaries, and those new memories become part of your own, so much so that you could go ahead and pass a lie detector test. And David, I think the real challenge for those of us who are interested in history, is why I'm always so skeptical or so worried about oral histories. Mm-hmm. We're now going to do oral histories of everybody who was involved in D-Day. We're gonna do an oral history of everybody right. who was you know, defended Okinawa. Well, you're going to get their memories today and they're going to be sincere about it, but I don't know how accurate they always are. Yeah. And and there was this study that you probably well aware of in which university researchers took a group of students after the challenger and they asked them three questions within like two days. They said, where were you? What time? Who told you? Mm-hmm. And they brought them back a couple of years later, asked them again. It's not surprising that half or more gave a different answer on one or the other. What yeah. was fascinating to me is that half of those, so quarter of all, when shown their original statements mm-hmm. said, no, I had to be wrong about that because I right. know what I'm telling you now is right. Exactly. That's the part in which memory is so dangerous because you aren't telling a lie in your own mind. You're just not remembering it correctly. Mm-hmm. That one strikes home with me because, and I may have told you this before, that the Challenger explosion what was for me a formative memory. I remember it vividly because I remember going down the hallway at the the school I was in at the time. And the class clown had just come out of the library. And I can see him to this day. I can see him turning the corner out of that door and saying, the space shuttle blew up. And we all said, Ray, come on, you know, stop it. You always do stuff like this. And he's like, no, seriously. And eventually we find out it, it, it happened. But that's my memory of it. And I can see it as clearly as I'm looking at you now, I can see that moment. And it was only years later that in thinking about it and telling the story, somebody else who was around at the time, a friend of mine said, well, that, that was the wrong year. And I said, what? I said, no, that was, and I can't remember which it was. It was like, that was sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. But we, the school that I remember seeing that in the library door that he came out of was in a school um, that I wasn't in yet. I was a year off. And yet my memory is clear as day. Yeah, it was fantastic. So the, you know, I, I pride myself on my memory because I have a very sticky memory for dates and figures. And I put together these books. And I'm, and my uh, sort of filing system is in my head. And I remember, and I was talking to Trisha, my wife, who, who works with me on every project. And we had been in Thailand in the late 80s the doing some research on Chinese triads in the heroin business. And I recalled to her recently, I said, do you remember that time we were in the restaurant and I bit into an, a rusty nail and I thought I was going to have to get tetanus shots in that. And she said, no, it was me. I bit into the nail. Oh. And I said, no, no. And then we talked about it and I realized, oh my God, she was right. I do recall that. And I do recall the, the tetanus shots. And somehow I transferred that entire event to myself in doing it. And that I thought, whoa. The, at that moment until we had to go back and like reconstruct it, the, the pitfalls of memory are substantial <laughs> and uh, the, it makes you just wary when you get together with somebody years after an event and you're doing a story or you're doing a history and they tell you something, I often say to them, why is it that you remember something today better than what you described in a contemporaneous document? Now, exactly. if they can say to me, I was afraid of saying it because of X, Y, and Z, or I had a non-disclosure form and I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you that I also took notes Mm -hmm. over the years of what had transpired and I'll show them to you. There are sometimes a late memory can be very forceful, Mm -hmm. but you know, I go in with a level of skepticism. Right. 
Well, if memory is not a challenge for us, then you can uh, ask me many questions about my excellent book called Case Closed, uh, <laughs> in which I looked at Lee Harvey Oswald and the assassination of JFK. You will probably think that you wrote this amazing book, but we all know the challenges of memory now. You did a great job on Thank it. You. It was one of my favorites. <laughs> Thank you. And it's funny that all of the uh, criticism and praise for it seems to come to your inbox, not mine, but that's just a, a weird thing. Yeah, they, it's this, just a glitch. I've said this publicly before. Um, case closed, uh, to which you have issued afterwards a couple of times in new editions. Um, but case closed for me was the formative book on the Kennedy assassination and understanding it decades ago, supplemented only by this massive tome, which you see me trying to lift up now, which is Vincent Bugliosi's Reclaiming History, 15, I think 1500 plus pages of actual text um, that's apart from bibliography and notes, thousands of pages of which are on a CD-ROM. But to try to understand what actually happened that day and led up to that day of the assassination, and then to unpack the investigation and all of the myths that came afterwards, you did an immense amount of research at a time when more of the accounts out there were cherry picking rather than true dissertations on the topic, having done the research. What drove you to that in the first place? How did you decide that this is something I'm going to devote a lot of years and many years since to when you could have chosen a lot of other things to become obsessed about. Well, you're right. I never knew about the many years since, you know, as a book writer, you think that's the book you publish and then you move on to another subject. So that part wasn't certainly in the equation. Uh, you understand publishing and information. So this will make sense to you. And I think some of your your listeners may or may not be surprised, but we as writers don't get to pick the subject we're writing on. We've got to find a publisher who's interested enough and enthusiastic enough to write a small check as an advance so we can go off and do the work and pay our bills. And I had actually always been interested in the Kennedy assassination. I was going to law school in San Francisco at Hastings, University of California, in the late 70s, right over the period the House Select Committee, 75 to 78, was redoing its assassination and concluded with a 95% certainty on what turned out to be flawed acoustic evidence later, but that it was a conspiracy. So I had been intrigued by the case. I had done other books and I went to Random House in 1989. And I, my, my bias was I wasn't sure what had happened, but if you had said to me, what do you think could be, I thought maybe the mafia was involved because of Ruby's murder of Oswald. That right. seemed, without having studied the case, pretty suspicious. Mm -hmm. That's why I was. And and I said to my editor, Bob Loomis at Random House, are you interested in a book that goes ahead and studies the case, doesn't conclude who killed Kennedy, because I didn't think that was possible, mm -hmm. the, with any def and instead... It can't all be right, I meaning it can't be the Russians if it's also the Cubans and if it's the CIA, right? I mean, there's a right. lot of stuff wrong here. It can't be a, sh a, fire, a shooter on the grassy you knoll if it's somebody in the sewer. Mm -hmm. So let me go through and clean out as a lawyer and investigator all of the junk that is wrong. And then mm -hmm. we settle on the three or four issues that can't be resolved. You publish mm -hmm. the book and say, here's a primer mm -hmm. on the case. Read this before you read anything else. And they came back at uh, random and said, nah, we're, not, we're not interested and nobody will be actually interested in reading that. So I went off and did a book called Hitler's Children, Sons and Daughters of Nazi War Criminals and Interviews with Them. And then Oliver Stone did the one good thing he ever did for me, unintentionally, of course, um, a great filmmaker, bad historian. He did JFK in 1990. And that film uh, put the Kennedy assassination back on the radar for everyone. So Random House that said, you know, that book you were thinking of, there's probably a market for it now. They didn't, it was a, a small book for them. They didn't pay a lot for it. And about halfway through, David, my, my research on that, I came to the feeling that it was in fact leading to say Oswald alone with a lot of updates from what the Warren Commission had. I had a meeting in New York. I lived only three blocks. Trish and I lived on 54th and 2nd at that time in Manhattan. Random House was on 51st. Hmm. Um, between third and Lexington. So I went down for a meeting, saw Bob Loomis and Harry Evans. Bob was my editor. Harry Evans was the publisher. 
mm-hmm. the husband of Tina Brown, he was better known as in America, but in Britain, he's quite famous because he ran the Sunday Times investigative section for years. And he created a team called the Insight Team that went off. He would give assignments to people for months. They would go off and see if they could develop a story. Mm-hmm. They could never do that today in newspapers. They return empty handed. But when they returned with real stories, they got the Lidamide and DC 10, some great stories. Yeah. Harry thought it was the mafia. So he said, what do you have? And I said, I think you can put out a book. Instead of saying, here's a primer on the case, you can say, here's, here's who killed Kennedy. And yeah. Who? I said, Oswald. And who? I said, Oswald. (laughs) And there was this like momentary little panic in which they thought, oh my God, he went out and read the Warren Commission. What are we going to do with it? We have this book coming out. Then when he saw what was new, like somebody who becomes a born again Christian, he became a born again lone assassin person. And Mm -hmm. he sent out letters. He promoted that book. And one of the reasons that book succeeded, I believe, is not just because it happens to be right, but Random House got behind it yeah. on the 30th anniversary when 14 books were published. It was the only one with that conclusion. We thought no one would be interested. And I have to give them credit. They they put that book in front of people who then talked about it. Well, the book is is remarkable. And I have memories, perhaps flawed memories of reading it many years ago. But because I wasn't sure of my memories, I recently listened to the audio version, which I had not done before. And and it brought back those same memories. So at least I'm not fully flawed, which is, I mean, you, you, you are not necessarily a fan of the Warren Commission report. You question a lot of things that were, were taken as fact in the immediate investigation, but you use updated evidence as well as logic and reasoning and argumentation um, to, to, to come to that conclusion. So in a nutshell, for those people who have been living in a cave for 60 years, um, what is the, the surface level description of what happened that day? Um, let's start with, with Lee Oswald going to his place of employment at the uh, school book depository. Um, what actually happened in terms of how many bullets were fired and whom those bullets hit? Yeah, I mean, the the overwhelming evidence of updated ballistics and what can be done on the case 30 years ago when I was working on this book, but was not available to the Warren Commission and the FBI in 1964, right. proves conclusively now that the only bullets that hit the president and the governor of Texas and then killed the president were fired from behind the motorcade in the general direction. You can sort of have a cone of where the possible assassin can be in which the Texas School Book Depository, the sixth floor on which Lee Harvey Oswald was left by a number of his co-workers half an hour before the assassination, sort of in the middle of that cone. You're not, you don't know yet who killed the president or who the shooter was, but you know where the shooter was placed by the latest ballistics. So behind the president firing, how many times? Three shots, evidence on the so-called Zapruder film, the home movie of the assassination, about a first shot that misses one of the mistakes the Warren Commission gets. We can now track in in digital time the people as they turn around who later said, I heard a sound from behind. You see them on the film reacting to a shot very early after the uh, the car turned. That shot deflected by something that might have been the branches of the tree between, but we know where it ended up. It went 500 feet out from the depository, nicked a curbstone and wounded a bystander, James Take. A second shot fired three and a half seconds later. That is the so-called single bullet or the magic bullet, as Oliver Stone and others would deride it. It needs no magic. We now know it went right through both men, through Kennedy and Conley. The ballistics people who figured out how that happened and the bullet emerged in fairly good condition can reproduce that shot all day long with an equivalent bullet uh, on similar size car- uh, you know, uh, cadavers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the head shot, the fatal shot, five seconds later, in which the shooter has the most time to make the shot. The limousine, which was going eight to 10 miles an hour and the motorcade has slowed up to five or four miles an hour. The driver of the car is making no evasive maneuvers at all. Kennedy is sitting in a back brace, his head lolled a little bit to the left. The shooter gets the straight on shot with the longest time in the scope that is on that gun. It looks like it's 25 yards away, quite close. He still almost misses, but he hits the president in the high right rear portion of the head, inch and a half higher, 
he misses like we know with Reagan and Hinckley. If Hinckley's an inch over, mm-hmm. Reagan's dead. That's the difference on these working sometimes or not. Mm-hmm. So what we know is the shooter is behind the president in that general vicinity. And then you look at where Oswald is. He brings in curtain rods. He says that day to the fellow who drives him in. They're wrapped in a brown paper bag. Yeah. That's in fact the gun that is tied ballistically to the bullets to the exclusion of every gun in the world. Mm-hmm. That is left on the sixth floor where his co-workers left him. Where is Oswald? He fled after the assassination, went back to his rooming house, got a pistol, runs into a policeman who he then kills in front of a dozen witnesses. So there, and his fingerprints are on the rifle. They're in the sniper's nest. I conclude that there's no question that Lee Harvey Oswald was the shooter and the only shooter at Dealey Plaza. He fired three shots from behind. He killed the president that day. The tougher question you will understand this completely coming out of Dili Plaza is, did he do it for himself, mm-hmm. some warped motivation, or was he doing it for a group? That's always the difficult part with an assassination, is figuring out whether the assassin's there for themselves or doing it for somebody who hated that figure. Right on, right on. Uh, in terms of the shooter, it's uh, the shooting itself. And in terms of the shooter, I find fascinating your short and elegant description of the events of that day relied on physical evidence, right? It's not, you know, well, somebody recalls months or years earlier at somewhere in Louisiana, seeing him with somebody else who later implied that this happened. Therefore, there, there's none of that in the core description of the facts. The, the facts are the things that science can help with, the things you can actually test, you can recreate, you can try to poke holes in. Um, that's, that's the gun. That's the bullets. That's the updated acoustic evidence. Um, the ability to use modern techniques to to analyze what happened. Case closed is the appropriate phrase. Um, there, there is no plausible explanation, even if you accept at face value, which you cannot do for many reasons. But even if you accept at face value, many of the rumors, innuendo, loose ends that are out there, they don't rebut that physical evidence, do they? No, you know, that's very interesting because I start at Dili Plaza in terms of my investigation. And you will understand this in terms of journalism. You hope as somebody on a, on a subject like this to come up with the, the most scandalous, greatest, biggest headline story. That would have been at the time yeah. um, a piece of credible evidence that would convince everybody that there was a conspiracy in the case. Sure. Uh, the uh, without any doubt, you, you come back with the conclusion in the end that is Oswald alone. It doesn't sound nearly as sensational as uh, you know uh, coming up with that conspiracy. So I start with the physical evidence because if there's more than three shots, mm-hmm. then there's a conspiracy because Oswald would not have time for more than three. Right. If somebody could say to me with updated ballistics, by the way, that single bullet is absolutely physically impossible. We'll show you why the men were not in the correct position. That was the, I don't know until I start to talk to the experts what those updated experts will say. So it was possible that they might provide the evidence confirming a conspiracy after all these years, just from the physical evidence of what took place at Dili Plaza. And then you'd have to figure out then, what does that mean? Who was involved? And you'd have to go from there. Instead, when you find out that the physical evidence leaves it so that it's just a shooter from behind. And then you look at the rest of the evidence and determine that's Oswald. The people assume often who know something about the case that when I, they, they'll say to me, what about that crazy bullet? What about the single bullet? And I'll say, there's overwhelming evidence that took place as the Warren Commission thought. They believe that when I say that, I'm then saying Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I'm saying nothing of the type. I'm saying that one bullet that struck the the president that day went on to do wounds in Governor Conley, and that is the Commission Exhibit 399. But it doesn't say anything about who fired it. It doesn't say anything about what might have been a conspiracy. So people look at the the evidence in Dealey Plaza thinking that if you come to conclude, they spend too much time there, in my Mm -hmm. view, because once you look at the credible evidence and realize what it says, then you have to move beyond that to determine what else it means in terms of the assassination, but they all get stuck on the question of, you know, was the president this way? Was he that way? Was there an extra shooter? And to me, that's a great waste of time. And so much of that uh, does end up tracing back in at least the last 30 years, tracing back to Oliver Stone's JFK and how that influenced the American public. And we'll get to that. But the roots of conspiracy thinking were 
were there long before that. And let's be honest, there's a reason for that because there are conspiracies in history. You know, 9-11 was not um, a random act by somebody. It had been directed by a terrorist organization. Um, even the Lincoln assassination was part of a conspiracy to also take out Vice President Johnson and William Seward and and others. Conspiracies do happen. So it's not ridiculous to think that there could be a conspiracy. In fact, it would be malpractice not to investigate whether there was some greater conspiracy. But the facts as we now know them are pretty clear that Lee Harvey Oswald killed John Kennedy and, and did it alone. It wasn't that long after the assassination, however, that the conspiracy thinking started. And one formative effort in that regard that I think most people have forgotten, but you have studied is Mark Lane and his book, I think it was called Rush to Judgment that came out very quickly within a, a couple of years after the assassination and after the Warren Commission was was working on this. Talk a little bit about those those early years and how people were, what were they questioning about the assassination and the investigation and how did it lead them to these other explanations for what happened. I, I will I will talk about Lane in that early part, but I want to go back to something you said in the beginning of that, which sure. was that, that there are conspiracies in 9-11. We know that there was Islamic terrorists plotting this, and we know that uh, you know that these, these happen. But I have found something that surprised me. When I did a book years later on the King assassination, I was so happy mm -hmm. that I found a small conspiracy of uh, you know these uh, these racists out of Missouri that's provided put up a bounty and that the the Ray brothers may have acted and done that I said oh my God you know some evidence of a conspiracy that wasn't a conspiracy to mm -hmm. most people I spoke to when they say conspiracy they're not looking for Osama bin Laden and a group of Islamic terrorists who went in they're looking for a, a conspiracy to a lot of people today means a grander conspiracy yeah. not that's a, a kitchen point. sink one it means. You know, the, the, the secret government is involved. Uh, we have some dark, uh, puppet master pulling all the strings. So I realized, oh, my goodness. Yes, the legal description of conspiracy. What I view as a conspiracy as a story in the Lincoln assassination isn't today. Hell, when, they, when I say I have a conspiracy and they hear it, people are crestfallen. They want to hear the big conspiracy. Point. If they're thinking they, grand conspiracy, the, yeah, the yeah. entire government is hiding yes, that's something. Right. That's or right. at least a particular agency or department that's is right. hiding something. That's but right. it's probably at least a government and maybe the world government in collaboration with the Illuminati and aliens and others. Right. Right? It's very and, big, and, very fast. And, and the fantastic part is, and I am getting to Mark Lane, but the, the government agency, whatever government agency that is, or secret department or, uh, that pulls these things off, 9-11, Kennedy assassination, whatever, they're the only part of the government that work at supreme efficiency. They, you know, you build a homeless shelter, it's That's not right. on time and are on budget, but they're, right. the people who are doing the nefarious things, you know, get to pull it off with like, you know, James Bond efficiency, but that aside. And so, you have leaks about everything, you know, every, every month there's a leak about something from some, about all kinds of things, but, but no one in this grand conspiracy has ever leaked the real truth. No, no, it's fantastic. No, no. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, it goes, you know, I was a political science major at Berkeley uh, a long time ago. And so my view of government is somewhat inefficient and bungling, but often well-intentioned, but they don't do things completely right all the time. And so the idea that government of all entities would be able to do it, but that's another issue. Uh, so after the assassination, I do think that there, there, the bulk of the American people believed that it was Oswald and public opinion polls, but it was primed. Public opinion was primed to move to more doubt because Ruby had killed Oswald. If we had the assassin, if James Earl Ray had been killed two days after he was arrested by somebody with ties to white supremacist or, you know, the, uh, or Sirhan had been killed by somebody yep. with ties to the police department, yep. we'd be having many more theories. So the idea that Kennedy's killed by a guy who looks like he's out doing a casting job for the mafia, no wonder people are a little suspicious. And then into that comes the Warren Commission, which says, okay, here are all these volumes, 28. Nobody's reading all of that. Most people are reading just a summary in Time Magazine or Life Magazine. And the first big book that comes out that challenges it is Mark Lane. You're right. Great title, Rush to Judgment. Uh, and Lane, the mistake is that I think that many reviewers in large newspapers and in the public thought of Mark Lane as an independent researcher 
who was coming to the case without his own bias. He'd gone in to try to find the facts. Lane made a great case for the defense. Lane wanted to be the defense attorney for Oswald. Oswald was killed before Oswald could make the choice. So he became the attorney for Marguerite, Oswald's mother, before the Warren Commission. And right. what Lane's book is, is an argument for the defense. It's a brief. So he doesn't, he is not stuck to his to accuracy. He is not required to footnote his material. He can take second and third hand accounts of hearsay that counter the official story and spin them out as other facts. That book had a tremendous impact, but it really is the lawyer's brief for the defense that Oswald never had, trying to raise as much doubt as possible. And then you have a series of them. The original books that came out really were as Lane was, he was really a hardcore, you know, he's sort of a hardcore left winger, um, uh, Buchanan, a European uh, American living in Europe, who was a member of the, the Communist Party, wrote one of the early books. The reason the left responded that way, Harold Weisberg, who had lost a security classification with the State Department, uh, wrote a series of books, was because their, their knee-jerk response was Oswald, defector to the Soviet Union, avowed leftists and communists handing out leaflets in in new orleans months before he murders kennedy for castro mm -hmm. that has to be false they it, they must have he must be a fake operation because nobody advertises so clearly mm -hmm. their political leanings and then carries through on an assassination so they came to his defense not in personal defense but the defense was to say it's not just oswald it's mm -hmm. much more than that there are things here we don't know and the Warren Commission had set up no apparatus to answer any of that. So it all went unanswered, yeah. which made it look as though it had some force. Plus, they had locked up they, the Warren Commission at the request often of the Kennedy family. A lot of files were sealed, too many files in my view. Mm -hmm. That added to the feeling that there was something to hide. And it's hard to imagine today people who see the Zapruder film on YouTube that we – and the American public didn't see it for 12 years. Right. You know, it was yeah, bought by Time Life. They ran some black and white pictures of it and then some color stills. It wasn't until 1975 when Geraldo Rivera on an all-night program, um, uh, America Tonight, played it for the first time. And, and when people first watched the film, as you know, I had the same reaction. You see it play out and it looks like the president shot from the front right. on the headshot. You see the car going along, the president's head goes back and to the left, and you think, oh my God, there must have been a front shooter. That was the reaction in 1975 when people saw it, and they said, why has the government hid this? Right. And so it wasn't the government that hid it, but it all compiled by that time. We knew about lies in Vietnam. We had had Watergate. We were in the middle of the church hearings in 1975, in which the FBI was being outed for its illegal surveillance on Martin Luther King and MK Ultra, these programs. So there was a there are a lot of people ready to believe the worst about the assassination. I do find that interesting. Uh, hypotheticals and counterfactuals are dangerous, but if if the similar event were to have happened, you know, 10, 15 years earlier, the the public feeling about government was different, right? Would there have been this belief that you know, pre Watergate, um, you know, I'm talking 1975 now, right? Not 1963, but 1975 with the attitudes towards the film. Um, yes, people would have still had that immediate and natural human reaction of, but I see his head moving this direction. That's weird. When explained, when you have actual, you know, medical professionals explain why that would happen, it totally makes sense, but it's, it's not, it's not what a, the average human being sees. But even with that, I do wonder if the diminished trust in government that happened from the uh, very late 60s through the early 70s from a combination of factors combined with that in a unique way that did leave the space open, as you say, for the things that the Warren Commission did not investigate or did not cover fully for other reasons that we'll talk about in terms of some government agencies and departments holding back information that may not have been directly relevant to the assassination, but it looks like it in retrospect because they were, they were covering something up and they were probably just protecting other secrets. You put all that together and that is a mix that is just, it's, it's understandable that people would step in and come up with these alternate explanations. 
I think that's absolutely right. And I, I think in that way, the, the Kennedy assassination is sort of the mother of uh, modern day conspiracy mm. theories or distrusting government. It wasn't at the time it happened, but it became that as it got enveloped, as you said, into yeah. all the, the late 60s turmoil um, about uh, Vietnam and Nixon and afterwards, with, and, and even Iran Contra, the idea that there are there are government there are conspiracies inside of government fed the idea that oh they must have gone all the way back here to to the Kennedy period. In addition, I think that uh, th there is um, something. There are two things about this case that makes it somewhat unique. One is that it's Kennedy. Now, I know that sounds like a throwaway line, but it's true. There's a fascination with the Kennedys that continues. Uh, and, and, and this is not to say that if Eisenhower had been assassinated, we wouldn't just have been as horrified and all. But there is a, a, a you know, for Lyndon Johnson, but the, the Kennedys in particular. And there there was an element that I think led to s some of the speculation dis other than just Oswald being killed is that the first modern day assassination of a major political figure, uh, the only other one is King afterwards, which takes place by a rifle shot from a distance. So we are accustomed, you know, World War I, the Archduke or Lincoln or whatever, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, later with Reagan or uh, the people, uh, Sirhan Sirhan, they run up to the person they want to kill. They've got a pistol, they shoot, the, their victim, and then they get tackled at the scene. Now, we don't know if it's a conspiracy or not, but we know who the shooter is right from that moment. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you get the rifle shot from a distance, which immediately conjures up Jay the Jackal, hired assassin, professional. The assassin gets away in the immediate aftermath mm -hmm. of the assassination, so you don't tackle them at the scene, so you don't know exactly who it is. And uh, that, I think, lays some of that groundwork. And then, of course, once the assassin's caught and killed a couple of days later, it's surprising that there wasn't more distrust mm. at an earlier time. If that happened today, with the public as primed as it is to embrace conspiracies, I think you'd have 70% saying something's wrong in the first public yeah. opinion poll. Absolutely. And, and and even then, just that idea of the rifle and the assassin who got away, I think, contributed to the ideas that that came out pretty quickly. There was the Six Seconds in Dallas book by was it Josiah Thompson? I can't remember yeah, who wrote good, that one. Good title. There's some good titles in the Kennedy yeah. assassination. But <laughs> that's the one that you know. I think his one of his conclusions was, well, you know, it must have been a crossfire from at least three directions. Um, well. I mean, I, I, I guess if people are used to the the image in their head from their history books of John Wilkes Booth coming up behind Abraham Lincoln and having a gun within inches of his head, having someone shoot from a rifle and then get away, it, it does lead to that, okay, there must be something else behind this because that's not the norm that we're used to. The I, I think also, David, I, I had the view when looking at the case that even when the the ballistics expert and then the forensics that I looked at and, and had looked at with medical examiners in terms of the x-rays and photos from the autopsy of the president, which also show where the shots came from. Mm -hmm. Even when you conclude that the only bullet to hit the president and the governor that day came from behind, that doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't another shooter at Didi Plaza. For So for instance, you might've had, maybe there was a world-class assassin somewhere, wherever, mm -hmm in case Oswald missed, or the Absolutely. person shooting from behind missed, they wanted to take the president out. This is really a sophisticated, like you know, others have said, conspiracy. And that assassin either never had to fire or fired and missed everybody. That's the real magic. So, you know, I, I look to see, we know Oswald's the only shooter who hit anyone in Didi Plaza. Was right. he the only person there firing? And I'm convinced the overwhelming evidence on that is, you know, you can't prove the negative all the time, but right. every place in which somebody has put a shooter, I show how the accounts of that became more floored and more detailed as years passed. People read other accounts, so they saw nothing. There were eyewitnesses to the assassination who saw nothing that day. But then as they would hear other people say, I think I saw a puff of smoke, they would say, oh, I saw a puff of smoke. Then they would see a flash of light. And now I think I saw somebody run away. Oh, mm -hmm. I chased them for a while. So if you read the latest account, it sounds like, yes, there's another assassin somewhere. But when you read the early accounts, you realize how this just grew into a 
a phantom shooter out of um, sort of a collective uh, mass hysteria over time. Now, one of the, it wasn't right away, but not too long after, one of the formative issues that that fed into future conspiracy thinking about this and became really uh, a bedrock of it all was the Garrison investigation. Can you talk a little bit about about Garrison, what what his investigation was based on, and the fundamental mistakes that that he made that are incontrovertible? I mean, when you look at what he did and how he did it, um, wh- whether you like the fact that he was doing it or not, uh, there are definitely some real challenges with the way that he pursued the investigation and uh, potential leads. So walk us through Garrison and what he did. So, I, I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, the, the, the takeaway conclusion is what you said at the end, that I knew the Garrison investigation led nowhere. I didn't know until I did the book, and there have been separate books written on it by some journalists, that what he did is a, a stunning disgrace as an attorney. He could almost have been charged for the abuse. The Garrison thought there was a conspiracy in the case. He's the district attorney of New Orleans, and he brings a seriousness in the late 1960s to the assassination conspiracy theories that they don't have on their own. Yes, you have six seconds in Dallas and you rush to judgment. Those are books. Now you have a district attorney in a major city in which Oswald was spending the summer, the months right before the assassination. And and this district attorney says, I think that the, the basis for killing Kennedy was formed here in this city and I'm going to be able to break the case. Well, every conspiracy theorist in the country sort of went down from Harold Weisberg to Mark Lane to, to they all went to volunteer their time to help him. And he conducted a probe in which I have no doubt that he believed there was a conspiracy and that he was going to uncover it. And he didn't care in the end if he trampled on the rights of innocent people to try to find that out. So he took snippets of information that his investigators would find. And then he looked for somebody to leverage that information against. And he decided eventually it was Clay Shaw, this pillar of the community um, who happened to be gay. Uh, and he had this idea that it might have been a gay, you know, a thrill killing. He had some unusual ideas that changed all the time with Garrison. But he brought charges against Shaw in which he believed that even if Shaw wasn't the linchpin that he was charging him as, that others would come out of the woodwork somebody would come out and he would find that evidence and he would be able to break the case. Right. It took the jury, I think, what, 40 minutes, and that included a bathroom break to be able to go ahead and quit Shaw. The sh- shame of it is that the American public never knew how bad the case was. They yeah. just thought that Garrison had brought a case. It didn't work, but they had this feeling. He must have had something. Yeah. Sort of the same thing people left the JFK film with in 1990. Yeah. I would say that people later, you know, that film is wrong. And they would say, well, even if 20% of it's right, it's still something. So with Garrison, he must have had something is what you see in so many articles and contemporaneous news coverage. Over time, Garrison was savaged for the inaccuracy and the dishonesty of his investigation, not by people who thought it was Oswald alone, but by conspiracy theorists yeah. who said, In the later years, the 1970s, we think he did terrible harm to the process of finding out what happened in the conspiracy because he set us back with this crazy idea. That's (laughs) why when Oliver Stone did JFK, it was particularly offensive because he relied on Garrison to make the movie uh, in terms of that uh, story. And I get it. I understand. I am I, not a Hollywood producer or director. They love a hero in a story. That's why uh, Spielberg tells the story of the Holocaust through uh, Oscar Schindler, somebody who's trying to save people. You don't tell it through the dark eyes of the, the evildoers. So Stone is looking for a hero. There's no hero in the Kennedy assassination because no one's uncovered the conspiracy. So Kevin Costner becomes Garrison. And it just rehashes the worst of the theories of the case in many ways, which was a shame. I think that's the influence that I have been most interested in is how Garrison was picked up by Oliver Stone and that the movie JFK was, was seminal. I mean, it, it was a, I think you've said it's a good movie, but bad history. Um, I'm not convinced it's a good movie. I I, I think it was, it was, it was interesting and it was dramatic, um, but it was a little overwrought and I thought it, it wasn't necessarily great film, but it was influential. Right. And, 
and here's the thing, and I can't find the the poll, but I do remember seeing that after JFK had been out and was a success, that poll showed that it did move the American people, that people were more likely to believe in the cover up, the conspiracy, and all of this. Um, but there's just some fundamental garbage in there that not exclusively, but largely derives from Oliver Stone taking what Garrison did and then presenting it in a documentary-like format. Uh, It was not explicitly presented as this is exactly what happened, but he wasn't exactly saying it's not what happened. (laughs) So it led to this belief because there was nothing else out there in visual form as compelling as the Zapruder film itself. This was the most compelling visual reference for most Americans, and it did influence people. So talk a little bit about the film itself. Uh, The thing that sticks with most people when I bring up the movie is they'll talk about, you know, the head moving back into the left, back into the left, and repeating over and over again that this thing that your eyes tell you is, is important, hitting that really hard to the exclusion of mountains of evidence. But along with that, what else in the film do you think did the most, if you will, damage to a common sense understanding of the facts? Well, I think it's cumulative. Right? The film has this powered impact. And when I say good filmmaking, what I mean is he mixes real you know, clips of what happened at the time, Zapruder yeah. film and others, together yeah. with recreations, but so seamlessly that unless you know what you're looking at, it's not clear. Yeah, I mean, and that's why you call that, you know, it's almost a semi-documentary feeling at a time, but it's a mixture of real and and created. Um, And that's what makes it so incredibly dangerous. So one of the things I think the big takeaways is Mr. X, you know, the meeting of this. There is a representative here of the secret plot sitting on a park bench. You know, the uh, it's based on an account by Fletcher Prouty who had a a CIA affiliation and and tells a wild story in real life and has has been debunked for many decades for the accuracy of that story and how it comes out of whole cloth, but gets resurrected again. He does not call Fletcher Prouty in in the film by uh, Stone. It's, you know, it's Mr. X. And so it becomes a, it's a mixture. That film is a mixture of X-Files and the idea that there's something that's being kept away from you People leave with that absolutely being hammered into their head about the the bullet. It you know the bullet, the magic bullet, as so well dis, uh, talked about by uh, you know by Garrison or Costner. It comes out. It does a flip flop. It does a couple of somersaults. It makes a left turn, a right turn. It has a cup of coffee, and then it goes on to hit uh, Conley. And it's almost like a laughable thing. You can't believe that anybody that could have ever have been accepted by anybody as being real. And I, I think that the reason Stone at first had put it out as though believing this was history, real history, even though it was a film. And then when he got great pushback by so many writers and historians, he said, well, it's my version of what happened. The Warren Commission has its version of what happened. This is my version of what happened. And I thought to myself at the time, what if uh, a filmmaker with Oliver Stone's talents, he has talents, and the, and the backing of a major Hollywood studio did a version of their version of the truth that said the, that denied the Holocaust, said it's not, it didn't really happen. It's manufactured and mm-hmm. left audiences in a three hour film feeling, oh, I wonder if it was really 6 million Jews killed, maybe it was only 500,000. And what, I tell you, people would have been marching in front of the theaters. Yeah. The the film would have been pulled out. But it, but with Kennedy, there was no outrage at all because by the time Stone had done that film, part of my disappointment is that Kennedy's assassination had passed into being a, sort of a quasi board game. It was you could sit around a table and say who killed Kennedy, and people have their own theories. Oh, I think it was the CIA. I think it was the FBI. No, I like Castro. Uh, the odd person might say it was Oswald. It was. We forget that's the death of a president. That there was this traumatic tearing of the the political. There's this personal tragedy in terms of the family and that, and and that was is disturbing to me uh, maybe i'm just old-fashioned about that but that yeah. there was no outrage like that over the fact that we could do this on something as important as the assassination of a president because yeah. it had become popular culture in the worst possible way and there's also something to be said beyond that to oliver stone's intentions he famously said on the set of the movie 
I'm shaping history to a degree. He he knew what he was doing. He he knew that this was a piece of propaganda, if you will, um, that maybe he wasn't sticking to the facts, but he was explicitly doing it to change opinion, to make people think about it, which kind of makes you wonder, um, why is it that a garrison uh, and perhaps Oliver Stone, um, I don't know what's in the heart of, of either man, but both of them were very credulous. Um, both of them were were willing to believe things that most people looking at the evidence would would see otherwise, and yet they so wanted to believe something that it allowed them to move forward um, with these ideas. Now, it could be that they heard something from a witness, and you're right, maybe evidence was used to get them to say things they didn't quite believe in the Garrison case. Um, but there were other things out there, right? There, there were outlier comments about things, and they would just run with those and assume yeah. they're true. Clay Shaw being the victim, not at the same level, of course, as John Kennedy, but right. Clay Shaw being a victim of this as well, given the the rest of his life and what it did to, to him and his finances. Um, it does make me wonder about the motives that it's easy to say that people who posit grand conspiracies are themselves manipulative and maniacal, and, and maybe there are some, but I think many of them are just people who have very, very strong confirmation bias from one original yeah. bad idea. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right about that. And uh, the, and, and since of course, uh, 1990 and the JFK, we've seen more about Stone's real hardcore politics, you know, his interviews with Vladimir Putin and, uh, and Snowden, he clearly uh, it thinks that uh, some of the worst of the theories about what's going on in the U S and his reaction, by the way, I learned something about him when I, Published case closed in 1993 on the 30th anniversary, three years after. Mm -hmm. the He would occasionally say something dismissive about it. And I would say, you know, I'd be happy to have a public discussion with you, a debate. Let's sure. go over to the Oxford Union. Mm -hmm. the, no, he never took me up on that. But the, the part that was interesting, I, I published uh, something in the New York Times once uh, in the magazine section about documents that had been found in New Orleans that further showed after the publication of the book, how terrible the garrison probe was. Stone wrote a letter to the Times that was published, and I have it somewhere, it's online, uh, saying, you know, it's great that Gerald Posner has access to the New York Times, but people like me don't have it. Those who yeah, right, talk about the alternative theory, and that's because Stone and others believed, and I learned this the hard way. I've never, you know, I've written books about Saudi Arabia and 9-11 and, uh, you know, mm -hmm heroin gangs I've never had a police report or a police case created other than case closed when Trisha and I received physical threats we were assaulted on the street in New York on mm -hmm. a on a plane by a flight attendant got a, a delivery of dead fish one time a rat's tail sent to us um and th that was because people like Stone and others thought Oliver Stone has come out with a film that re-energized the hunt into who killed Kennedy. Yeah. And then the secret government, the puppet, you know, masters had to come up with an answer to Stones. They found this guy, Posner, who knows nothing about the case and sort of had him come out with case closed, which the mainstream media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the news anchors uh, at the time embrace because those organizations had never really aggressively investigated the case. They had all thought it was Oswald. So they're waiting for somebody like Posner to come along and say it's Oswald alone. Then they feel confident, oh, we were right all the time. So they, they endorse it. It becomes a finalist for the Pulitzer. All of the success of case closed was evidence that the secret government was working to right. close down the interest in finding the real killers that Stone had talked about. So people who thought that I must be part of that cover-up effort, boy, I tell you, they were really something. Yeah. And that the problem with this, and this comes up in a lot of the conspiracy thinking, is the number of people that must be involved. Now, you've laid out a different dynamic there, right? Which is that some of the people may not have been involved in the conspiracy, but because they didn't investigate it well enough, then they're going to, in effect, try to cover up for their previous um, inability to do so by covering it up. So it's almost like a second level conspiracy. But even the first level conspiracy, let's go to the recruitment of uh, Gerald Posner to write this book in the first place. 
Um, wow, to, to be able to do that and to be the, the tool of these grand powers that are at work, um, it must have made you immediately fabulously wealthy and you must be getting all kinds of benefits and you certainly would never want to challenge the government on anything. Well, most of that is belied by your life. Um, you've written plenty of things that are not flattering of those in power uh, in many ways and it kind of goes against that theory, but that really doesn't matter to them, does it? No, David, this is so interesting. So again, live and learn and things that I now understand completely, but I would not have thought of at the time. Best example of what you just said. In 2003, I published a book called Why America Slept. Mm -hmm. It was a book about the failures of intelligence, of uh, being able to spot what was coming in 9-11. Of course, Monday morning, looking back, it's much easier to see what pieces of evidence mattered in the massive deluge of information that comes in. At the time, you have to sort of know which ones are important. But looking back, you say, oh, well, these six pieces were critical, so they should have seen those, right? I was very, very hard on both the CIA and the FBI. And I thought, boy, that really puts, you know, all those people who say, I was writing this for the government. When they read that, they'll see how I take them apart. What did the conspiracy theorists on 9-11 say? They said, that's classic Posner disinformation for the following reason. What he does is he takes the CIA and FBI to task for missing the 19 hijackers coming into the towers in the Pentagon. Well, we know that's the official story, 19 hijackers on three planes. It's not talking about the demolition of the buildings, the planted explosives, so the controlled planes. So I didn't realize that what I was doing by this, what they call professional wrestling, taking the CIA and the FBI to task, saying you did a terrible job on this, is just part of the effort to say it's really only 19 hijackers. The conspiracy people view beyond that. They always find a way mm -hmm. to put you back into the conspiracy lot, and you realize after a while, my God. Okay. I'm happy that it's just as I used to think I'm happy as a fringe group, meaning a small number. Mm. But now as I watch things play out and I realize that we have a sort of a generation of people that may have a, a degree from the university of TikTok or something, mm -hmm. I'm worried that there's more and more of that type of uh, right. thinking. And you can't win. That is people who are looking to poke holes or find some possible reason why there might be a, a motivation for someone who they disagree with, you can't win because you can't disprove every negative. Um, you can't necessarily explain every loose end and anecdote in a major investigation, um, whether it's 9-11 or the JFK assassination. That's right. But eventually, uh, somebody who wants to actually build a story and come up with an explanation and, and frankly, it does come back to that human tendency of big events should have big causes. And, right. I, and I get that mentally, right? If, if something huge and horrible happens, it's hard to believe it's a lone gunman with a right. few bullets. It's, it, it should be something bigger to bring down this larger than life president. I get that mentality. But when you try to build the story that is different than the actual story, you end up in some pretty weird places. And I want to run some of these by you to describe this theory, if it is even considered a theory, um, but how people come up with this and why it falls apart. And I'll start with the one that I, I don't know why, but this one stuck with me even as a kid when I first started getting interested in this. And that's the Umbrella Man, the person in the Zapruder film who's shown holding an umbrella when no one else is and how quickly that led some thinkers to say that, well, it wasn't Oswald who killed the president. It was the man with the umbrella. Um, walk through that story and then what we now know about the man with the umbrella and why it's so innocuous. I must say the Kennedy assassination does throw just about everything into one particular case. You know, every odd thing that you could imagine happens, just about happened on this. Um, and one of them is the umbrella man. And when I first look at it, you you have to be suspicious that something's going on because it's not it's just strange. a person on a sunny day with a large black umbrella. He happens to be standing right along the edge of the curb near where the motorcade is passing in front. He's not a long ways away. And he opens the umbrella with the front of the umbrella looking toward the motorcade as though if it held a, a, a bullet inside or that it could fire toward it at the moment, essentially, that the president is first struck. So his timing is very unusual. And what I thought 
when I first saw it and started to study the case was not that it was some secret, uh, you know, gunshot umbrella, but was it a signal? Was that a signal to some shooter somewhere, even if not Oswald, we're underway, all right? Not a very subtle signal, but <laughs> nevertheless one. Um, and I and for a while, they could not, they investigators could not find who the umbrella man was, which added then to the mystery of what mm -hmm. had happened. So as I say, there are a lot of factors in this case that when you first look at them, make you suspicious that there's something more at play. And as an investigator, you must look into them to see if there is. In the case of the umbrella man, he was found finally by the House Select Committee on Assassinations when they did their work in the late 70s. He's a regular citizen in Dallas who happened to have this long dislike, peculiar historical dislike for Jack Kennedy's father, who had been the ambassador to Great Britain mm -hmm. at the time before World War II and had been considered somewhat pro-German, had been there at a time when Neville Chamberlain, the British prime minister, had had the great, you know, sort of peace in our time, which was uh, later viewed as a moment in which he, you know, gave in to Hitler and, and set the basis for World War II. Right. And he thought that Kennedy's father had been a, a disgraceful uh, pro-German. And this was his protest because Chamberlain and others would have the British umbrella up all the time in these meetings. He was going to have this umbrella out. It was, and he had talked to other people about it. Yeah. There were others who said, oh yeah, this is unusual. He's a little odd and, and this, and this is what he did. He never came forward. He didn't know he was the subject of such focus because there were reports about him, but you really didn't see it play out until the Zapruder film was seen in 1975. And then you saw it play out in real time, more than just a still. And you thought, God, that's odd. And so they really went to effort to find him. It turns out to be nothing, but it is a strange bit of serendipity. What about the theory that, and it's funny, when you when you look at the range of theories, books that have been written, um, and of course, then you go to articles and podcasts and everything else. But there are theories out there that it was, you know, Castro or that it was anti-Castro forces, right? That it was... Uh, Russians, or it was anti-Russians, that it was the CIA, or it was a rogue element of CIA that wasn't sanctioned. You can find almost anything, and they're contradictory. Right. But the ones that seem to to have gathered the most as they roll downhill are the mob theory that somehow the mafia itself was involved in the assassination, or that it was CIA working with anti-Castro forces. Um, talk about each of those, um, both why they were initially plausible to people looking for a grander conspiracy and why it is that you assess that there is no such wider conspiracy. So I think when you say assess those two possibilities, that people get confused. You understand this, but meaning that they think that if I say Lee Harvey Oswald killed Jack Kennedy alone, that I'm also saying there were no conspiracies against the president. I don't think that's true. I think that at any given time on any U.S. president, whether you were talking Obama or, or Trump or Biden. There are many people who don't like them and want to undermine them, sure. Right, right. Somebody's talking about, let's kill that president. And if you're able to pick that up on surveillance, you're going to have evidence of a conspiracy. If somebody came in tomorrow and, sh and, and they suddenly had a tape recording of, mafia bosses like Carlos Marcello or that sitting around a table saying, let's get that no good SOB. I wouldn't be surprised. The people assume that because somebody then kills the president, they must be working for one of those plots. And that's not necessarily the case. That's the hard part to establish is that Oswald was doing it for anybody other than himself. But those plots, there could have been talk about killing Kennedy. Um, the anti-Castro Cubans hated Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. They viewed him as a traitor and some of them celebrated his death. So, you know, I don't have any doubt that they, you know, th there was an angry group there. The, the mafia was furious, not so much at Jack, but at Bobby, who was trying to break up the mafia and it deported Carlos Marcello. So there was no love lost there. Sam Jean Cana had had an affair with Judith Exner, the same person that Jack Kennedy later had an affair mm -hmm. with. There's all types of stuff going on. You know, people say that, uh, the, the mob helped uh, seal the election for Jack uh, by g delivering Illinois. Even if he lost Illinois, he still became president. People often forget that. Uh, it's a little sidetrack. But maybe the mob did work to get him votes, and they thought he didn't give them enough back. So there's all types of things. On that. I understand that. The thing is, we have evidence that's incontrovertible that the mafia, 
at the highest echelons the, and the CIA at the very highest echelons, including the, the director, uh, the were in a plot to kill a head of state in the early 60s. It was Castro, yeah. not Kennedy. There was a different head of state 90 miles away from uh, the continental United States, and they failed miserably over nine, 10 different attempts. They never even wounded him. So the same two groups, and they had real incentives to get uh, Castro out of Cuba. The mafia wanted their casinos back and the CIA wanted to get rid of uh, a communist government that had had missiles there uh, just a year earlier and caused the Cuban Missile Crisis. They couldn't kill him. And were to believe that those same two partners somehow turned around and pulled off the perfect crime in Dallas, mm. and so much so that people like me who have investigated subsequently are completely fooled by it and mm. think that, yes, it's just Oswald. We still buy the fake story. That's how good they are. And I look at what they did with Castro, and I just don't believe it. There's, and there's something, David, that, that I think a lot of people miss on this mm. for Oswald to be part of a plot, he has to be brought in by the conspirators at some point to kill Kennedy. And there's a very narrow window on this. So that's why all of the things that people say, oh, in New Orleans, he was hanging around with this character and he was doing this back here. And, you know, mm -hmm. it comes down to essentially seven weeks. And here's why. Oswald left New Orleans on September 25th to take a bus ride down to Mexico City because he wanted to get a visa to go to Havana, where he thought the real revolution was. Right. It was a 24 hour bus ride, essentially, with these different transfers. Mm -hmm. While he was on the bus, the White House announced for the first time that Kennedy was going to be visiting Dallas in November, uh, Texas. They didn't say the cities for this political trip. So no one before that knows Kennedy's going to Texas. Now, no one that I've ever spoken to thinks that the Cuban mission diplomats and the Soviet diplomats at the Soviet mission in Mexico City were part of the assassination plot. They turned Oswald down for his trip to Havana. If they hadn't, he would have been in Havana on November 22nd. Right. But they turned him down. Right. He comes back to the United States on October 1st. That means that any group of conspirators, mobster, CIA, Russians, if they decide they want to kill the president, they want Oswald to do it in Dallas, they've got to bring him into the plot. There has to be some evidence of a contact, a person who visits him, somebody who shows up, a telephone call. You know, is there limited ways for that to happen? And those seven weeks, there's no evidence of that contact. There's nobody he's living in a rooming house. His other roommates report that he never gets a visitor. You know, he's got contact with his wife. They go through all the, the FBI goes through all the pay phones around the, the place where he worked. So my point is that for people who think it's a conspiracy, then all you have to do to convince me is tell me where in that seven weeks, one of the conspirators reached out to Oswald and said, we want you, even if it's bringing in the rifle to the, the building. You don't think he's the shooter, but he brought the rifle in and he fled afterwards and killed a policeman. He's involved in the plot. Where did they contact him to tell him that? And there's no evidence of it. And an important point within that, Gerald, is if it were the case, that you're looking for that bit of evidence somewhere in those weeks, and we know nothing about what Oswald was doing, then at least there's a plausible argument to be said, well, because he's a complete cipher, because we know nothing about those days and weeks, then it could have happened and we just, it's, it's a tightly held secret. The problem is, whether it's the original commission or, or your work or Vincent uh, Bugliosi's work and others, we know what Oswald did really, really well between all of the people who interacted with him, the hundreds, if not thousands of people that were interviewed, who had access to his movements, um, the ability to trace where he was on certain days. Um, it's not as if there are days or weeks available when he could have been having secret meetings and no one would have known. You can definitively say where he was, who he was with and what he was doing for the vast majority of that time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's a critical point because, and I only learned how important it was. Not the, I took that for granted, meaning that when I was doing the book, relying on the work from the Warren Commission, looking at all of the testimony and, and going back to it and talking to people in Dallas, I took for granted the fact that he had moved into this rooming house and that he had other people testified about what he was doing. And then he made the telephone call once a day or every other day in a foreign language. That seems exciting until you realize it's Russian. He's talking to Marina. And then all the people that work with him, 
I took it for granted until I did the book on the King assassination. And I learned that, oh, in comparison to Oswald, James Earl Ray is more of a cipher. He's a real loner. He's on his own out there. You know, he's he's taking dance lessons and he's getting a bartending class lesson with some other people. And he's yep. having a, a, a nose job. But otherwise, there are weeks when he's just traveling on his own with right. no contact with anyone. That's harder to figure out because you don't know exactly what contact might have been made. But with Oswald, we have that very, very clear understanding of what he was doing in those seven weeks. And I'll tell you, people say what well, was plotted beforehand, but it's impossible to have a plot to kill the president without knowing if the assassin that you have picked, Oswald, is going to be in America because he's trying to leave America or any sense of time or place which you need to have once the president's going to Texas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a bit about the impact of this conspiracy thinking on not just opinion of, of what happened to Kennedy, but also on other conspiracy theories. And it points to, to, to me, it points to just a larger issue of critical thinking. And when I've taught critical thinking, whether in the government or undergraduate or graduate classes, what I will often do is ask people on any issue, whether it's, and it could be the Kennedy assassination, but usually it's on something having to do with international affairs or uh, national security. You know, do you think that the United Nations Security Council should be expanded to include other countries, just as a very boring example? Um, and, and people have an initial opinion, you know, and if we're lucky, it's half of people in a class say one way, half say the other way. And as a critical thinking exercise, it's okay. So y- your initial belief is that the Security Council should be expanded. Your assignment is to make the best possible case why it should not be expanded. And on any number of issues, you can do this. Whatever your preconceived notion is, and in some cases, it's a well-thought-out, well-argued notion, but you need to make the best case for the opposite because that's the way you expose holes in your own argument. That's ways you are open to evidence that you might have been blinded to by confirmation bias or other cognitive issues. So I'm going to make you do this, Gerald. I'm going to ask you to make the strongest case you can for a conspiracy behind the assassination of Kennedy that did involve Lee Oswald. What is the evidence that you can point to, even if it's overwhelmed by the evidence on the other side, but what evidence is there that you've seen that you say, perhaps grudgingly, but you say, you know what? There's something there. There's something odd. There's an anomaly that isn't explained. And I can see why this is evidence for a conspiracy. So the the strongest conspiracy case would be that Lee Oswald acted at the behest or encouragement of the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that until he arrived to try to get to Cuba. And they said no to him, but he had a very good relationship with one of the the Cubans working there, she had stayed in touch with him. There's a report that Cubans have never released their final notes about what this meeting, that at one point he was so frustrated that he wasn't able to get there that he said, I could go back to America and kill someone to show you, kill a, a capitalist to show you how important it is uh, that I'm committed uh, to the cause. The question is, the, did the Cubans then know that they had a live wire? and that he might be able to stop the Americans from killing Castro. Because at the highest levels of the Cuban government, Fidel knew the Americans were trying to kill him. So it wasn't a matter of just dodging every time and hoping you didn't get the poison pen. You had to worry about the fact they were going to continue. And if the president isn't stopped or Bobby isn't stopped, they didn't know the Cubans knew that Bobby Kennedy knew about it, but they viewed it as an American operation. So was it we have to kill him before. People say the Cubans would never be involved because they know that if they were unmasked, their island would be destroyed. True. But Castro was all about survival. So yes. when he's back yes. in Dallas and they're looking for him to make his mark, possibly mm. by killing the governor or a U.S. senator, and then it turns out that he lands a job by coincidence at, the, at a building in which the president's motorcade is passing, that three days before when that becomes public information, he's He doesn't need the activation in terms of a call. Mm -hmm. He knows the duty. And then to bring this all around, I would argue that he was returning to Mexico 
for the safe haven of the Cubans after the assassination. We don't know exactly where he was going because he was interrupted by J.D. Tippett, this policeman. But Oswald had left about $187 on his dresser that morning for his wife. That's almost all the money they had, his life savings. He had taken off his wedding ring, but he had about $13, $14 in his pocket, which was enough to pay for the bus trip to Laredo and then on to Mexico City. And he was about half a mile away from where that bus would stop about 45 minutes later. So I would say the Cubans had set up the basis for encouraging him. He acted on behalf of the Cubans. He was going back to their safe haven. Mm -hmm. And that's been missed by everybody. Now, mm -hmm. the, I, I think that the reason I don't argue that that is case closed is because there's too much of that that requires speculation. You've yeah. got to make the connections that we can't make. Mm -hmm. There had been a rumor years ago that Oswald sent a letter back to the Cubans, dropped it in a mailbox after the assassination and it's made its way to Cuba. But there's no proof of it. It would be fantastic if that was the case, then we would know. But that's what you said, David. I mean, I grew up in a, uh, in a Catholic high school with Jesuits and the debate club. Mm -hmm. They taught us to argue both sides. We had a topic every year on debate. You'd have to win your points for the National Forensic League. by You believed in only one side, but you had to be just as convincing on both. Yeah. One year is of whether they should ban unilateral military intervention for the United States. You argued for it, and then you took a position, you drew a, a card the next time you were against it. Yep. And the same thing in college when I was at Berkeley doing debate. You you have to understand mm -hmm. what the other position would be and why people are arguing it or contending it, or I think you fail in your own effort to say, uh, no, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. You talked about this letter, uh, supposed letter that was written, and it, it raises the issue of evidence that was not available to the Warren Commission that came out later, uh, evidence that perhaps was available to the House investigation, and then evidence that has come out since then. And we've talked previously, and I'll include a link in the show notes to our conversation on the Lawfare podcast with Mark Zaid when we talked about some of the previous uh, assassination records, as they're called, document releases. Um, what what strikes me the most looking at several rounds of these releases is how little is actually directly relevant to the Kennedy assassination, but how much of it, it appears. And, and please correct me if, if I get this summary judgment wrong, but much of it appears to be agencies and departments that had some information that was sensitive or secret for other reasons it was somehow related to this time period, often related to Cuba, sometimes Mexico City, and sometimes even Lee Oswald. But it was things that were not related to a conspiracy to kill the president, but they were protecting the reputation or sources or methods of the government entity involved. So that when they come out, yes, you, you do question, wait a minute, why were you hiding this for decades? But it turns out there's usually a rational reason for the hiding it, even if it's a bad judgment. And we look back and say, wow, whoever made that decision to hide this phrase, you know, to mask the term technical means for decades, because all that did was create more energy around the idea mm -hmm. that there is a grand conspiracy. Um, talk through that a little bit. Tell me, ter tell me where I'm wrong in terms of the overall judgment about these document releases and what there still is that could shed light on the actual assassination versus simply things at the margins that are very interesting to national security analysts, but don't necessarily tell us something different about Kennedy and Oswald. No, I think you summarized it very, very well, and which is that the agencies involved, uh, most of the documents still held, the 4,000 are related to the CIA, uh, some are FBI. They are more protective about those means and methods of collecting information or what they still view as something that's confidential than they are about people's impression that something is being hidden in the Kennedy assassination. That's not their worry. So I get that, although that clearly feeds that type of suspicion. And when part of the problem is the the release themselves, the law that created it. So after Oliver Stone's film, Congress passes this law with very good intent, should have been past years earlier, it's too bad it took Stone's film to prompt them to do it. You would think that the American public has a right to eventually see all these documents. But at least they that's passed. a good result from that film. And we needed one, no, right? No question. We did need one. And that was it. So the JFK's uh, you know, Assassination Re Review Act says we're going to 
look at all these documents over a 25 year period. There's an assassination review board established. It will release some, but then the ones that are still being contested go over to the National Archives. Assassination related is the key phrase in there. So that becomes a subject of debate. And what the agencies do for the most part is they use a large, because it's demanded um, by the Assassination Review Board, they use a large definition, broad definition, a liberal one. So all of the files are sent over, for instance, from the FBI related to organized crime investigations. Even though organized crime may have nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination, then there's some information in the organized crime files the FBI doesn't necessarily want out because yep. it involves a, a, an informant that today that family may be you know, involved in a legitimate construction business and they're not going to have to pay the cost that uh, their you know, great-grandfather had given information to the FBI that brought down the Cleveland mob or whatever. There's you know, those secondary concerns. In addition, the act said no redactions. They have to be released in whole. Now, people forget about that. And that's a shame. Not that I want redacted files, but uh, almost 2,000, I believe, of the 4,000 left have one word or one sentence redacted. That's it. Literally a word. We're talking about somebody's name or location that's been kept out. We're fighting for that. Those could all be out with that still redacted. And the CIA's argument, by the way, about many of those, that their disclosure. And so here's people say, how is it possible 60 years later they're still protecting somebody? Let's say that in Mexico City, which was a hotbed of espionage, the CIA had people on their payroll who were assets providing information who worked in the Mexican police or the federal police at that time. And they were getting their own intelligence on the Soviets or on the Cubans and providing it to the CIA. Today, maybe the family, that person could still be alive in their mid 80s if they were in their 20s at the time. Or the family could be prominent in Mexican politics and the disclosure that a, the previous generation had provided information to the CIA would end their career. There are all types of additional problems with that. But the thing that is interesting is when the CIA says with a straight face, we are protecting the disclosure of sources, means, and methods from our enemies, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if the Cubans and Soviets and that haven't figured out in 60 years... <laughs> Yeah. what you were doing and who was providing you the help, they're even worse off than we are. But but right. that aside, um, I do think that people forget among the documents that are still withheld in their entirety, mm -hmm. so we have never seen a word from them, are tax records. Yes, those are, those are uh, uh, you know, for the most part protected all the time. They include Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby. They include the tax records of a business that Oswald worked at. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know the notes that William Manchester, the historian who wrote Death of a President with Jackie Kennedy, they are still sealed in their entirety. So some of the things that are sealed might surprise people. Mm. And I thought, I've never predicted anything Donald Trump did because I can't predict him. He's too yeah. unpredictable for me. So I, every time I think rationally, I, I know what he's going to do. I say, yeah. oh, he's going to do that. But hey. if anyone was going to order the blanket release of everything, it, that, it would have exactly been right. It was the, the person who talks all the time about, you know, uh, 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 the secret government or that would say to the CIA, no, I don't believe it. Release them all. Uh, and, and it, you know, his, stone, his friend Roger Stone said he's going to do that because he thinks there's a conspiracy. So that was stunning to me that he didn't do it. And then I thought Joe Biden, who has a very vivid memory of the death of the president. You know, this is the only Catholic president we've had since Jack Kennedy. Uh, Jack Kennedy meant a lot to, to Joe Biden in a different way as a young politician. I thought he'd be the one who would say, I want them all out. But here we are still waiting for the final ones to trickle out. Yeah. That uh, leads also to the question of other kinds of evidence that come forward. And we already mentioned earlier the fact that in the last few months, we've had the story come out in a book written by a former Secret Service agent who now claims to have seen and and heard things that uh, he did not document at the time or in previous questionings and investigations. So um, tell us about him and what he's saying now and why, why, as you've written elsewhere, why you have questions about it. So Paul Landis, uh, late 20s on the Secret Service, he was on the car behind the president's car, um, now has an account that he has in a new book in which he says when the car arrived at Parkland Hospital, he went in to 
take some things out for Jackie Kennedy or eyeglasses and a lighter. And he saw two fragments of a bullet, which he never said in earlier descriptions that he left those in the car. And then he saw a whole bullet. And he thought, oh, you know, I don't know if the car secured that well. Somebody could come over here and take this or I don't know what to do with it. So his re reaction was not to pick up the bullet or point it out to his superiors or that, was to take it and put it in the, his jacket pocket. And then according to his account, you know, he's sort of in the hospital. He doesn't know what to do with it. And he says now he put it on Kennedy's stretcher because that's where it belonged. Here's what my view of it is. The is. I've talked to memory experts. I've talked to people, first of all, interviewed Landis. He didn't interview with me. Uh, including Peter Baker from the New York Times, people I respect. I know they're very good journalists. And they all say to me unequivocally, David, that they believe him, that he believes it. He's not a charlatan sitting out there saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to make a lot of money on this. I can't wait and telling a story. Now the question is whether it's true or not. So my view on it in talking to these memory experts are two things. Either it's concocted out of whole cloth or there is a part of it that is true. And this is where the memory people come down. They say, if in fact he found a whole bullet, that is not something you're going to forget. Mm -hmm. It's going to be branded in your head because you know you've done the wrong thing. This is this dereliction of duty. You didn't turn it in. And all the time you've kept silent. Boy, that's there. So the idea that you found a bullet isn't something that pops up as a, as a memory. You either made it up, it's not right, or that really happened. And then the question is, what did he do with it? Nine years ago, it turns out, I found out in looking into this, he told this to Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent that many of your listeners know from throwing himself on the back of the, the president's car as it was zooming out of Dili Plaza. You know, uh, He told Hill that he had found a bullet and that he had left it on a stretcher. He said as we were leaving the hospital, taking the president's body back in a casket to Washington. I didn't know what to do on it, and I took it out of my pocket, and I dropped it on a stretcher in the hallway. Now, today in his book, that's become, I dropped it on Kennedy's stretcher in the in the trauma room. Maybe that makes him somehow feel better about the mm -hmm. fact that he left the evidence there, that he left it with Kennedy as opposed to just dropping it on a, a stretcher. The reason his real account, though, the first account to Landis, uh, Landis gives to Hill is important, is how's the bullet found? The CE-399, Commission Exhibit 399, which is the so-called the single bullet. It, 45 minutes after the president had left Parkland Hospital, his body was taken back to Washington. The chief engineer of the hospital was walking down a hallway and bumped into, he hit a, a stretcher in the hallway. It hit another stretcher. There were two there and a bullet dropped onto the floor. He, the guy's name was Tomlinson, was never sure which stretcher it dropped off of. He testified yeah. that I wasn't sure. I couldn't see. I just heard this plank and I looked down and there it was. The Warren Commission at the time investigated and found that one of the stretchers belonged to Governor Connolly. He'd been taken up into the surgery with that, taken off for the surgery. The surgeon who did the work on Connolly for to save his life saw the bullet entrance hole in his thigh and knew it was a surface wound and sent one of the people in the surgical room after to look for the bullet. He said it's had to have come out as somewhere around. Right. They didn't know where they didn't find it. So the Warren Commission assumed it had to come from Connolly's stretcher. The other stretcher was of a young boy who was brought in for emergency treatment around the same time as the president. I believe that Paul Landis, if he's telling the truth about finding a single bu whole mm -hmm. bullet, has given us the answer as to how the single bullet ended up on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. He did this terrible dereliction of duty. He takes the bullet. They're leaving the place. He drops it on a stretcher, feeling it will be found and become part of the evidence because now I'll be questioned as to why it didn't turn in right away. It could have been on the kid's stretcher or on Conley's stretcher. That's how it gets knocked to the ground. So in my view, it's a footnote story mm -hmm. to the entire case and gives us some real, if, if it's right, some final clarity on how the single bullet gets on a stretcher. I don't think he made it up. I think there is some truth to this. And I must say that in the beginning of our conversation, when you held up Vince Bugliosi's uh, book, I think Vince would be much harsher than I am on um, Landis. He would probably say it's absolutely fake. I can't accept 60 year old testimony. You know, Vince had had a very sharp mouth on him mm -hmm. and um, and wrote with a sharp pen. And so I think that Vince would think it's just not possible after 60 years. But from some of the memory people I spoke to, I, I tend to think that the core story, finding the bullet dropping on a stretcher could be right. Yeah. What do you think to kind of wrap this up and project forward what do you think is the real legacy 
of this generation upon generation now of conspiracy thinking about the assassination. Um, we've talked a bit about its influence on things like 9-11 conspiracies. And the research that I've seen has shown that people who buy into one grand conspiracy are overwhelmingly favorable to others. Um, whether it's, you know, the U.S. government is hiding crash remains of aliens or the U.S. government is behind this or that, um, that it is more likely to believe that with others. But you've looked at this and you've looked at a, a number of other issues in the corporate world and in the government world of, of big events. What do you think the real legacy of the industry that's built up around the conspiracy thinking of the JFK assassination is? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's destabilizing in some ways because it's fed by social media. It's fed by, you know, if we had social media and we had TikTok and Twitter and, and, and the ability to pass around rumors when Kennedy was killed, the conspiracies would have grown much faster. We wouldn't be talking today about, uh, you know, rush to judgment. That would just be a book on top of everything else. People get their information today in little snippets, very clever videos. They think things are real. It's passed along. There's a lot of fake information out there. So now you have to pick out what's real versus what's not real. AI is going to compound that problem with AI fakes. Um, Google wants them all marked as AI fakes, but how many times do you think that's not going to happen? So, uh, you know, you would have had you would have had an AI fake of a grassy knoll shooter within three months of the Kennedy assassination. People would still be talking about that. And then when that is taken down by social media platforms, that's proof that it's the real thing. People don't think it's taken down because it's fake information. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Uh -huh. So I think that's, that's, that's made a greater challenge for people like you, me, others who say, hey, let's take our time. Let's look at the facts. Let's apply a little logic to it. Let's get some, you know, reasoning going because there's a rush to sort of get the information out and believe the worst about everything. And I think that is unfortunate so that, you know, Jeffrey Epstein uh, commits suicide in prison. It's immediately a murder. It must have been murdered at the highest levels of the government or corporate powers because they had to hide what he had to tell. Everything is immediately turned around. Now, you always had a reaction time like that, but I think that it has become more pervasive. People are more willing to believe the worst possible things or not the worst, let's say the most Byzantine theories without thinking them out very well. So, you know, I spent time looking at uh, Epstein's murder. I spent time on a lot of issues that end up nowhere. What I mean by that is I don't publish on them because I don't come up with any news. People think I only publish on the things that you know I'm writing about. No, I go down a long road. I spent months on that. And I realized in the end that the, the guards that night may have been negligent in doing other things, but they were 15 feet from his prison uh, cell. It's hard for somebody to get in there and start to choke him to death without a noise alerting everybody something was going on. There's all types of things I wish I could say otherwise, but people don't take that time. They jump to the quick conclusion that it's fed by this rush of social media. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, Debbie Downer here, that, oh, woe is I, it's all lost. But we are in a more challenging time for the accuracy of information. I just wrote a piece on Substack the other day about the incipient movement for uh, what I call October 7th denial, right. uh, sort of like early Holocaust denial, saying the numbers are less the people who were killed were killed by Israeli crossfire, mm -hmm. where the Israelis must have known. Uh, I don't believe that there were rapes. Now, yes, there's only a small handful, but it's making the rounds have 7 million views on Twitter, 20 million views on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And over time, that may grow. It seems absolutely to us fringe. And, and how could that be taken seriously? That's sort of the current um, psychis. Does it make you worry, Gerald, that if, and, and I'm not you know, suggesting this in any way, but just as a hypothetical, that if a recent president did have a serious assassination attempt, and there ha there have been some worrying incidents, uh, as as I've talked about elsewhere, um, with John Wackrow among others on this podcast, but if there were a, a, a Hinkley level event, we can say, or even beyond that, uh, God forbid, a successful assassination attempt against a U.S. president now. Do you think it would be a matter of hours or minutes before, no matter how clear cut it was, that there would be everything from deep fake video to conspiracy thinking? Do you think that is our destiny, that there's no way to avoid it? It, it depends on the case and the set of facts, because some will be less prone mm -hmm. to conspiracies than others, right? H Hinkley, 
is is difficult to come up with much of a conspiracy around him once he gives the Jody Foster yes. reason for wanting to kill a president. Okay, that's yes. interesting, but okay, it's harder to. Sirhan, much more, you could have many more conspiracies built around him and James Earl Rice. So in part, part on the assassin, but I have to tell you that I think it's within minutes that people start to doubt the official st- the story or yes. the assassin. They start to look for other things. And this applies, David, not just to an assassination, mm. but if we had, we haven't had the death, natural cause death of a president in office. That's right. If uh, mm. if Trump, who's in his 70s or had had when he was in office or Biden had a, a heavens forbid, a heart attack and they were brought to the hospital and then they don't survive. Let's say that that happened to Biden and the, the party put up Newsom for president. Newsom won in 2024. They'd say, see, it was all a plot. They knew the president couldn't win, so they had to bring in another candidate. And the way they did that is they yeah. killed the president, blah, blah, blah. So you're, they look back at what happens afterwards, and they see it through a prism as though it was all planned that way. Mm-hmm. And we know that's not how things work. So one of the things that's so fascinating, that happens on Kennedy with Vietnam. We get into this quagmire of Vietnam under Johnson, and people say reflexively, Oliver Stone and others, Oh, he would have not done that. He was smart enough to avoid it. We don't know that. Right. So you understand they look back and see it all as that's the way it was done because that's how it played out. And that's the part of where it really goes off the rails for me. Right. Well, let me reach into our vaunted chatterbox now for a pre-printed question to broaden this out. Oh, this one's fun. Gerald, tell us your favorite or least favorite spy or political thriller, movie, TV show, book, anything that's fictional about uh, some of these topics we've been talking about. All right. So David, how do I know that every piece of paper in the chatterbox didn't have the same question? The uh, See, that's a conspiracy thinking. Isn't that amazing? That's, uh, that's right. I can offer you the evidence of all of the questions and show you that of course, some of yeah, them likely are, uh, story. There's probably a second yeah. chatterbox with different, oh. real different questions. See, there you go. See, like I the like second the second shooter. Think. The, um, actually, uh, believe it or not, I mentioned it before. It is one of my favorites, The, the Day of the Jackal, Frederick yeah. Forsyth's book. It's an oldie, but a goodie. It's a fantastic book at the time when I first read it back, uh, you know, decades ago. Uh, it, it seems as though it is uh, for people that want to see how a real world assassin could work with a plot. It's a fantastic book. But I have to remind people sometimes it is a novel. <laughs> they <Yes>. Forget that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the problem, right? Is people uh, see it and the conspiracy here will say, well, actually, it's not a novel, right? It's X, a blueprint, right? right? X Files. People watched X Files. I enjoyed it. It was a great series. But people thought, oh, that's just telling what's really happening in terms of you know yeah. hiding aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I won't let you go without putting out a final plug to our listeners. If they've borne with us for more than 90 minutes and by any chance, any of them have not read or listened to case closed Lee Harvey Oswald and the assassination of JFK. Um, I will do a very uh, public and enthusiastic plug for it uh, in one of its new editions with additional information posted because it is uh, very, very useful for one, not only to understand the events of the assassination and what led up to it. And not only to understand this whole climate of conspiracy thinking afterwards that we've been discussing here, but also to check one's own thoughts and critical thinking skills, because the way you look at unknowns and examine what can be discovered and how it compares with what we should see if something else were an explanation is masterful. So thank you for producing that many years ago. Thank you for updating it. More importantly, Thanks for joining me today and talking about these issues. Uh, th- thank you for uh, the conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.